least of the working class in the, in the world, um, both in terms of formal employment and informal employment. And that more and more women are being pulled into the formal labour market as well, but often into very bad conditions. And particularly women with children end up with wages way below those of men and, and of women who do not have children. So the issues of the maternity gap, the issues of conditions at work, the issues of um, safety at work, safety from sexual harassment at work, all come out as huge issues. So can I ask Jabu first and then Vera and then Pat Horn to speak to us for a few minutes about their experience in, at work? Someone's trying to speak. Uh, hello. Hello. I think there's some echo here. Good evening all. I am Jabu Nala. Uh, you saw me last week. I'm back again. I'm, call, I'm talking from Oxford. Um, <clears throat> my involvement uh, with the uh, precarious work is mostly to do with the Oxford Living Wage campaign, which I am chair of in Oxford. As I explained before, uh, Oxford uh, is a tale of two cities because we have the, the working class and then we have uh, the, the people that, that have, so it's the haves and the have not. So the, the, the issue around uh, the uh, precarious work is that, it's that it, it, it is the illusion that it creates, it creates as if it's an inflexible working environment. But when it, what it does, it does the opposite. So my experience uh, with agency workers, um, I feel they should be referred to as uh, disposable workers because of the way that uh, the workers are treated in these uh, employment uh, circles. And most of all, i um, been organizing around with the students in the university who are very much uh, on the on the on the sorry on the on the ball with the precarious workers whereby the oxford university has uh, recently agreed to pay the oxford living wage which is uh, 10 pound 21 but found that uh, once it's paid the oxford living wage uh, it's been really tough to get them to pay uh, the workers that they employ as precarious workers in terms of uh, paying them the, 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 the living wage. But what they have done, they've agreed lately to pay the living wage, but they've then gone and clawed it back from uh, the workers who are working at weekends, who are mostly, I mean, most the women workers. Working at weekends, the shifts at the weekends tend to carry a different rate in terms of the, the hourly rate, but what they've done, they've brought down that rate and they're now clawing back what they said they will pay. So it's, a, it's very much a cat and mouse game. But more than anything, uh, my ex the experiences that are, are coming across from a lot of women and a lot of people that are working for the agencies around Oxford or around Oxfordshire is that the precarious nature of uh, their, their, their working environments and conditions are pretty much uh, uh, very much uh, loose and uh, not, not taken care of. There is no uh, a, 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 a filtering gap in terms of sick pay and holiday pay. People know that once they work, when they are working for these uh, types of hours, they can get called at any time and if they start to refuse these hours in terms of saying i would not i can't make it for the for the shift that you've asked me for it means a lot of shifts being cut back but uh, if they do carry on uh, doing doing this shift there is no uh, security in terms of uh, being looked after if there were accidents at work women in the front line especially those that have been working as COVID. I actually went with the uh, Rokasa as well as an agency worker where those workers were called COVID workers and they were being, um, they were doing almost 12-hour uh, shifts. This one was mostly brought around COVID because of the, the situation of COVID. So 
a lot of the homeless people that were around Oxford were put in different, uh, sec uh, different hotels, such as Travel Lodge, such as um, uh, lots of university empty buildings. But the situation is when once these uh, workers are brought in, they are not on the same similar stratification as workers that are contracted to work. But for those that are working, what I found with the Travel Lodge workers who are employed by Travel Lodge, they were uh, brought in, they, they, they are now working for reduced wages. And at the same time, they've increased their workload where workers are working as not just the reception workers, but they are cleaning. They are also uh, doing bar work. They are also cleaning the hotel rooms, all for the same rate. So the rate of exploitation has just increased. And uh, 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 this is not just for those workers. This is, uh, this is prevalent to shop workers. It's, it's prevalent to care workers. All of these uh, really inflexible type of uh, uh, demands on, on these workers, and uh, and yet there's an illusion that is created that these workers are working as uh, somehow uh, flexible workers. They can choose when to work. Uh, they can uh, come in when they like. But the reality of it, they are the most exploited because they don't get uh, allowances for sick pay, they don't get any allowances for holiday pay. But it's not only that, uh, there isn't much uh, research in terms of data collection as far as uh, these workers who are working in these, uh, in these conditions. So it's been quite a, 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 an interesting time in terms of, it's because it, it, they, are, they, are, they are dismissed as uh, unskilled workers, but this economy now is not just prevalent towards those types of workers. It is now uh, affecting even workers who are working as lecturers, who are working in university. Anybody that uh, is uh, deemed uh, under these uh, insecure types of contract is uh, in danger of uh, uh, being in that, uh, in that unstable employment and, and, and also there they are a lot of redundancies uh, being made especially uh, to, 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 with, with shops uh, where they've had long-term workers in contracts they are giving them redundancies and then bringing in new staff uh, to work on the former contracts for real real low wages so there's a there's a real real fight on in terms of what is going on with the uh, insecure work. I've uh, recently moved a motion through the Oxford Living Wage Campaign to the Oxford City Council. The Oxford City Council endorses uh, the Oxford Living Wage uh, Campaign. They support, uh, the, 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 I mean, it goes up mostly every around uh, November. So they support us in terms of saying yes uh, we will pay it and they pay their uh, employees the, the living wage but at the same time there's still that sort of gap in terms of understanding um, especially the insecure workplaces whereby they cancel themselves within their contract they are subcontracting uh, such workers as third party workers which is uh quite a, 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 a you know quite it's almost a um what uh, what i'll say a, a contradiction in terms of understanding the 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 struggles that the workers are facing and uh, the um the the relationship also with say oxford university and and the city council they try to kind of very much keep a really good relation, good working relationship with uh, each other uh, at the expense, I feel, of uh, the workers that are exploited because a lot of the things, as much as we are working with the council and the endorsed also living wage, we, we do tend to not uh, get told what has been decided. Like for instance, uh, there the, is quite a lot of um, talks between the Oxford University and the Oxford City Council where we come and find out that certain decisions have been made and we, 
people haven't been told about those sort of decisions. So it's quite a lot of issues here in Oxford regarding uh, the instability around workplaces. But the, more than anything, it's, it's worrying. A lot of it is worrying because uh, a lot of uh, the insecure work is mostly uh, uh, delivered by uh, immigrants. Uh, it's mostly affecting people from uh, different countries. And I feel this is deliberately done by a lot of agencies to recruit from this pool because they understand that a lot of people suffer from not understanding English. So it is easy to cheat them of um, uh, you know, wages and uh, cheat them uh, from, from understanding their rights because uh, I myself, I experience whereby they will uh, take something from your uh, pay slip and you try to get them to, 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 to give a clear understanding as to why something was taken, for instance, some jobs which are just, uh, 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 what you call uh, set through agencies. They don't even last even a month, but yet they will charge uh, workers uh, uh, training programs of up to 50 quid and they deduct it when they really didn't do any training, they just sort of give people an online uh, course and say, go and do that online course. And that's what they call training. And, and, and really it's, it, is, um, it is quite a tragedy in terms of the, the experiences that you see because a lot of workers are in this sort of situation where they are feeling entrapped. They are trapped in the situation they don't have any choices and they are finding it really hard to organize themselves because the nature of the precarious work is that the people that you work with you hardly know them you see them you don't see them you see them you don't see them so it 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 it, 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 it becomes it's not so much it's it's not a very good uh, place to organize uh, for unions in terms of collective uh, resistance that can take place and whereby like for instance we've got the cw which is um the the, po the union that deals with the postal workers which is quite a a good strong union in terms of uh, collective bargaining and, and, and action but they are facing a lot of issues when it comes to representing workers in this in this uh, uh, in this sector because they have the workers who try who do try and be strong and organize themselves around these they are targeted by those people that um, the employers or the, 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 the agencies, uh, they are targeted and they are, they are not given hours after they if, they, if they try to complain about certain conditions. And they okay, are- can I, can I ask you to finish in a-, in a Yes, 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 yes. Thank, I, you. I, I, yes. Thank you, I will finish, I will finish this. Just to say that the the workers are not given a, a, a sort of a support from the employees and they are targeted and they are sacked early and given early redundancies if they are seen to to be uh, agitating for union rights or for workers rights thank you thank you jabu i could have taken a whole page of notes of things we have to do as follow-up from that i think it's, it was a really useful contribution is it possible to ask um, Vera to speak next with a little bit about what happened in um, this week? Because I think that's too important to miss. And then um, a little bit, I've heard Vera speak about how she organises bef work before. And um, I am in awe of how, she, how it's done. But it's if you, if you could speak, Zara, for a little bit about what's happened this week and then a little bit about how the Home-Based Workers Federation works. Thank you. Uh, yes, but I think my internet is not working properly. Can you hear me? I can hear you uh, well. Uh, but your voice is not coming. Uh, okay, fine. Um, uh, the issue was that uh, uh, I think you know about uh, the motorway incident happened in uh, Lahore. Uh, that was happened in ninth, on 9th September. So majority of the people, even trade union and the women activists, uh, the political party was very active 
uh, to raise this issue because this is not the only one issue which happened uh, in the road that the women uh, in front of their children were was raped um, and even robbed by the by the theft and i think the police or or someone was involved in that incident and still the uh, the authority hasn't uh... i've lost sound from zero has everybody else hello ah great you've come back good so we have organized one um, demonstration uh, against the violence violence against the women even transgender so uh, when we organized this that demo on uh, 14th of september one channel uh, the name of that channel is gold and in the, on that channel they put my picture in one program and then they they have called one so called writer and he said very well he used very abusive language vulgar language for us and for other women so um, someone told me that we have to um, complain on pamra it's a uh, it's a pakistan electronic medium where we can uh, launch our complaint uh, launch our uh, complaint so i have launched my complaint i have filed the complaint but uh, there was no result or i didn't get answer from the from those authorities so that's why we have organized a demo uh, two days before in front of uh, press club and we i think we will go for the It slipped again. The sound. I know Zira is still there. Well, it says it says she's still here. Give it a minute to see. Does it link up? Felicity, I, I seem to recall there was a similar problem last week with Zahara's uh, line. So. If we're patient for just a minute, as you said, she may come back on. Good, good. Mm. Yeah. Your yeah, Pam's put on on chat just now the details of the response to the the rape in Lahore. And that's what Zira organised a demonstration against. And for organising that demonstration, she was then vilified in national press. Okay, Zira, are you back? Hello. Great. Sorry, I my net. I'm so sorry. I think this illustrates again the fact that we have to have more than a Zoom meeting as a connection. We've got to have, you know, we've got to have other things. We can do a video and, and show a video of someone speaking as well as um, relying entirely on the connection, which is bad enough anywhere. And if you've got people not wanting you to speak as well, it's twice as hard. Hello. Hi, Vera. Sorry, I think my net is not working properly. So maybe uh, should I write or email if again it's if, happened? If you could, Vera, we are hoping that we can set up um, a website just for this kind of discussion of how women are organizing. 
um, and we can be as discreet as we like on that with either giving proper names or not proper names. Um, so if you send things to me, I will put that up so everyone can, can see it. And then maybe when we're, you know, we have a chance, we can get a video of you talking as well that we can share. Um, so thank you very much for trying today. You can hear me. Can you still hear me a bit? Hello. Oh, hello. Hang on. Yes, please. What you are saying? Can you, could you Sorry. hear that I said, could you send me something in email and I will share it? Uh, yes, I will write it. Or, or do you have, do you have um, WhatsApp on your phone? Could we get a better signal on WhatsApp? Maybe, but it's uh, overall the internet issue, I think. So it will not okay. work even the, on the WhatsApp. Okay. All right. I think we'll have to do, we'll have to leave it at that for now. But thank you very much indeed. And um, we will, we will continue the contact and try and see what we can each do to help each other. Um, thank you so much, Zira, and I will be in touch. Thank you. So, um, our next speaker, I think, is Pat Horn. If Pat's here. Yes, yes here. Uh, I am. Felicity. <laughs> Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about organising at work and the difficulties facing women in doing that? Okay, um, well, um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, uh, women in uh, informal and precarious work, um, which is what uh, I know more about. Um, and um, I think uh, I think it's sort of fairly well known that in the labour market generally in the world, um, the gender division of labour is such that um, the work that's done by women is often uh, lower paid forms of work. Um, and when when women have come into the labour market, it's often at the lower end. Uh, in work that is not only low paid, but also often very insecure. So we were just hearing from um, from Jabu ab about this uh, in, in the current situation in, in Oxford. Um, often uh, when, when, when unskilled work is needed, then, then women get brought in. Um, in, in many countries now, it, 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 technically it's illegal to, to pay women less for the same work that men do, but there's many countries where women still get do paid less. But even in countries like South Africa, for example, where I'm from, um, women get paid the same as men do for the same work, but they don't do the same work. And the kinds of work they do tends to get valued less, so they don't get uh, equal pay for work of equal value. Um, because many women work in the informal economy, very often it's because um, of the fact that, uh, if, I, if I think of the example of the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, SEVA, the way in which that union started was when um, the town of Ahmedabad, which used to be sort of like the Manchester of India, it had a very thriving textile industry. When the textile industry collapsed, the workers in that industry had been men. It wasn't a woman-dominated textile industry, it was a male-dominated one. But when all those men lost their work, the people who then had to go out and, 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 and earn a livelihood were basically the women. Um, and in the global south, I think one of the one of the reasons why we find a large number of women in many kinds of informal work, it's not the, uh, the uh, uh, informal work is is in different sectors. Some of the sectors are more male dominated, but the number of them are very female dominated, particularly street trading, um, uh, home based work, uh, which is Zara's um, area. I, I listened to her last week. Um, domestic work, etc. 
Um, and those kinds of work tend to be not covered by social protection, uh, very often not covered by law. Um, some, when women work in agriculture, they often work in seasonal work, which again, it has conditions of informality, even if they do technically work for an employer. So um, on the whole, the way that the gender division of labor works is such that women have less uh, income, but they also have less security. Um, now, I'm not sure that it's more difficult for women to organize because in fact, um, if you look at, this, at, the, at the story of how women have organized, women have tended to get together and organize. But there are certain kinds of work that are very um, isolated and home-based work is one of those and domestic work. And the difficulty that women have in those sectors is that they are not in a workplace where they have, where they're surrounded by their other colleagues and therefore getting organized is difficult. But in sectors like um, uh, street traders um, and, you know, sectors where, where people work together, women do organize. The only problem is that uh, because society doesn't recognize those kinds of work, um, they, they, they're not regarded as workers. And they often, uh, often when you, when you organize people like uh, street traders, for example, uh, we, when we started to organize them in South Africa, we would go and talk to them about organizing for their rights. And they would say, no, I'm not working. I'm just trying to uh, feed my family. Um, and so, you know, they didn't even regard themselves what they did as work. So one of the key issues in organizing women in these kinds of work is basically the, the, the first step is to, is to get uh, women to identify as workers. Um, so that when they, so, and, and once they do identify as workers, organizing around um, the, the issues that affect them at work is, is a whole lot easier. But because generally, you know, in patriarchal societies, um, uh, women, uh, women don't see, women's work is not valued. Um, the fact that they ha might be, uh, economically speaking, the head of their household, even if technically speaking, uh, there's a man that runs the household. But in the case that I've mentioned, where, uh, where when the Self-Employed Women's Association in India started, um, it was basically because when the men in the household lost their work and there wasn't formal work for them, somebody had to go out and do it. And who was it? It was, it was the woman. And I think that's, uh, you know, one of the reasons why in many kinds of informal work, you find a lot of women because women have had to go out and hustle basically. So they regard themselves as hustlers rather than as workers. But of course, what they're doing is work. And if you, if you do a sort of a time study as to how they spend their day, these women who tell you they're not actually working, you know, it starts at about five in the morning and then it's, you know, carries on till about 10 at night. And then they say it's even worse because then you have the third shift, uh, you know, when you go to sleep and all you want to do is go to sleep. And, uh, and then you, you, then you've got somebody who's demanding that you do another shift. So, I mean, this is a sort of a humorous thing that a lot of the women in, in South Africa talk about. But basically, um, I think uh, it's not an accident that organizations of workers in the informal economy have been led by women. Uh, so the, the fact that in India, SEWA arose as a, as a pioneering organization, organizing women in the informal economy, um, isn't an accident. And the fact that since then, I mean, I had the good fortune to go and spend two weeks in India in 1993 with the organizers in Seva and to see how they organized. And I found a lot of similarities with the way that I'd learned to organize in the emerging trade unions in South Africa in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then, you know, since then, organizations of home-based workers around the world have expanded organizations of street traders, and, and the organization that I worked for until last year, StreetNet. I'm still an advisor there. Um, and uh, organizations like uh, Waste Pickers organizations have emerged, and many of them are led by women. 
And that isn't an accident. Um, it's basically because women workers do tend to get organized, even though they organize against great odds where they're being exploited, undermined, not uh, respected as workers. Uh, the dignity of the work they do is not respected. But there are increasing movements of, of organizations uh, in the informal economy. So there's an, an international domestic workers federation. There's an international street vendors organization called StreetNet. There isn't an international home-based workers organization, but there are regional ones. There's HomeNet South Asia, HomeNet Southeast Asia. Uh, there's, there's a move afoot to um, get these regional organizations together into a national, international organization sometime later this year. Um, that, uh, that's being organized by the organization called WeGo, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, which is a technical organization which provides uh, technical support um, to organizations in the informal economy. Um, so basically, um, I, I could say a lot about that, but I, you know, maybe I'll just I'll sort of leave it there that um, it's, it's worth following up on the organizations that do exist. Um, there's now been, since the 90s, when I started to do this kind of work, uh, there has been um, an increased recognition of the organizations in the informal economy by the trade union movement. Um, it was, it was uh, when, when SEVA first started in India, they, they met a lot of opposition from the Indian trade union movement. Um, eventually, they were um, recognized and allowed to register as a trade union in India, and eventually they were accepted as a member of the um, International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, and later I took the International Confederation of, of International Trade Unions Confederation. Um, and more and more, uh, I think because of the fact that the formal trade union movement is, is losing membership uh, as the world of work changes, um, uh, the, uh, some of the members of the trade union movement have understood that it's necessary to extend their organizing to cover more uh, non-traditional sectors of work, meaning the informal economy, uh, seasonal work, uh, precarious work of various types, um, uh, contract work, uh, what they call a triangular employment relationship, disguised employment relationships, etc. All of the things which are much harder to organize in the traditional trade union movement. But there's been some, uh, over the last 30 years, there's certainly been much more recognition by the trade union movement of the need to expand into uh, work in the informal economy for its own survival, if nothing else, apart from the fact that that's what trade unions are supposed to do. So, um, and I think the key issue, and one of the reasons why it's been hard for workers in the informal economy with their organizations to be accepted is because they, have got much more women women dominated organizations not exclusively but uh, you know many more and the formal trade union movement is very patriarchal as we all know uh, some of us have sat in trade union congresses and you know struggled to get more recognition for um, sort of stronger women's structures in the unions um, and it's taken a very long time because you always sit in male dominated meetings and try to get those kinds of uh, decisions through. So this is why organizations like SEVA and like StreetNet, uh, from the word go, set themselves up as women dominated organizations and have been much more able to, to have women led organizations, build up strong women leadership in those sectors of the working class. Um, of course, uh, with informal work um, in the global north, um, uh, Europe and, and North America, a lot of the informal economy are migrants. I can, I can see that you're mouthing something at me, Felicity. Yes, you probably so asked me to wrap up. Could we? Yes, please. <laughs> so, so finally, just to say that um, in the global north, what's uh, further compounded the difficulties of organizing 
in the informal economy is that the fact that a lot of the a lot of the people in the informal economy in that part of the world are migrants and then the issues of migrancy which which is another area of uh, sort of oppression and vulnerability um, then uh, uh, compounds the um, the vulnerability of uh, being in an informal sector of work. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, and yes, indeed, on the issue of the difficult difficulties of migrant workers. Can I now bring uh, Elena in on Belarus to talk about quite what's happened um, this week? To update us and to talk and to generalise it a bit. Thank you. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I will try to give a quick update. Well, yesterday was yet another women's march, well attended, with about um, 150 people detained, as always. Today was everyone's march, which, were, which they called 97, the march of 97%. And it was in the wind and driving rain with lots of military vehicles to stop the protesters, with lots of um, people being picked off before the march. But they have a, a technique of arriving at the general um, places of gathering as in, in very, very small streams. So they just trickle in and pretend to just walk around. Um, even against that, the police employed the new uh, tactic of just picking on individual people and searching their bags, uh, checking if there is any flag, any slogan in there, and detaining them. Um, so, um, or trying to pull someone out of a crowd, pull someone out of a group or out of a human chain. Um, so today, the latest information I've got, about 200 were detained. Unfortunately, none of the presenters that uh, hoped to join us tonight uh, were able to make it because they're still getting home from the march. Uh, they closed uh, off the internet, um, the public transport was closed, uh, so people are just making sure that uh, all friends uh, are there and safe and uh, not detained and trying to help those detained. And um, we also hoped to have uh, Lisa Merleak, who was um, as international secretary of uh, the Belarus Independent Union, um, with us tonight. She herself, she was detained, and then uh, she had a, a hearing. And uh, I just want to thank again all the international trade unions who very quickly rallied to defend Lisa, started sending messages of protest. I'm sure it helped in some way. Lisa got off with just a, um, uh, a fine of um, equivalent of about 90 euros and so many people kindly offered to pay their fine and she said no no don't thank you it's very kind i'm not going to take that money first i'm going to appeal uh, because uh, obviously it's uh, completely unjustified and um, she's going to go ahead and do that and she said that at the moment financial donations straight to the trade union not to the workers could be almost a, a hindrance because the authorities of course are accusing anyone who is doing anything of being completely puppeteered and controlled from the west and paid from the west so it's 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 a it's a, it's a very tricky ground but of course people who are actual striking uh, workers who live you know, one salary to the next and have lots of loans and uh, responsibilities. It's very hard for them and people are just uh, running around to try and to help them in a targeted way. Uh, if someone knows a family with some needs, like a kid that needs getting ready for school or buying food for them, it's, uh, there are various uh, accounts and uh, ways to do that. So it's, it's getting there, help of getting there. And again, we're, we're all very grateful for all the solidarity and uh, help and all the friends that are watching Belarus internationally, seeing what's going on. Of course, one big surprise for all was this so-called self-inauguration of Lukashenko last week, uh, which uh, was responded to by, you know, it's, it's completely farcical and lots of people did marches uh, wearing like McDonald's or Burger King crowns in their heads, self proclaiming themselves, you know, the king of the whole universe, you know, the father of dragons and what have you, mother of dragons. Uh, and um, it, basically it was a you know, humorous response to a pretty ridiculous situation. But uh, he is effectively now not legitimate. And uh, today even Emmanuel Macron called 
on him to step down, uh, which was very good of him. And uh, the only person who formally recognized him and congratulated him was the Turkmenistan head, who is uh, you know, another one of the dying breed of dictators, father of the Turkmen people, Turkmen Mashi, as he is known. And even Putin didn't really formally congratulate him on the uh, inauguration. I think that they're trying to wash their hands of Lukashenko because he is, as someone said, he becomes like a suitcase without a handle. You know, you have to do something with it. You, know, you, you just extended him alone, but uh, you know he's not going to pay it back. And, uh, his, uh, all his orders are not legitimate because whoever comes next is not going to stand by them. And uh, so that, that, that's the, the update about what's, what's going on at the moment. And uh, I know that um, David asked me to uh, say a few, word, a few words about probably international solidarity and how it's organized at home and uh, in the diaspora. Yeah. I can see nodding. Uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm a little uh, short of words because I was muted. Um, look, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, but maybe um, come in again, uh, if you could, Elena, uh, when we are talking about, you know, what to do next, because these are the urgent items we'd like to discuss. Is that okay. possible? Mm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And also, I'm happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Mm. I think, thank you very much. Um, at this point, I'm going to open it to, um, to contributions for a short time before we go back to um, actual people presenting for us. Um, could you please use the, um, the raise the hand button on the, um, on the participants list? And then we can see um, who wants to speak on it. And we are at this moment talking about how we can how women organize basically around employment and the issues around um, obviously we've, we've had the second issue of, of what's happening in Belarus political instability and how we have to respond to that I haven't got any hands up I can't invite anybody to speak I have, um, I'm not quite sure why some of the comrades who were going to be here from, um, from Britain are not here. Um, literally, I was in touch about 10 minutes before the, um, the meeting started and they were coming at that point. So presumably there's been an emergency of some kind they've, ha they've had to deal with. Um, so... Is there anyone else who would like to contribute at this minute? Is there anyone indicating Viv? Vivian, um, would you like to come in? Um, can I ask a question? Please do. I wanted to ask Elena a question but it might not be the right time for her to come back Just about that. okay well it's obvious that the workers in Belarus and the women in particular are very brave and very determined and they've put up with not only their employers but the police and they clearly want better conditions and better rights to organize and that the, the police shouldn't um, beat them up and rape them in prison and so on. Um, <clears throat> obviously, that's really important. But what I wanted to know was the extent to which there was a feeling of a, a taking it to a higher level, if you like, um, because you've got the Western powers, you've got the EU and other countries probably, who uh, would like to take control of Belarus's mineral wealth and production capabilities and return those to the capitalist system. 
you've got Russia who's who's determined to keep its influence or perhaps it's 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 not very keen on Lukashenko but it doesn't want to lose control over Belarus I don't think so I'm just wondering about the generalization and the possibility of moving to a higher level uh, well that might be yeah strictly speaking not just the women, women's issues question um, no no yeah. absolutely not no. in terms of uh, yeah the general feeling that of course everyone's ready to move it to a higher level and uh, the coordination council uh, various people were given interview and as soon as they're given guarantees that they're not rearrested the minute they cross back into Belarus and put in prison mm -hmm. or worse they of course would want to come back and uh, you know I don't know even whether it could be called a dialogue because no one from Lukashenko's government is at the moment ready for a dialogue or responded to any attempts of the Coordination Council of a dialogue but certainly some of the Western powers and uh, some people in, in Russia certainly are ready to discuss what might be next. In terms of mineral resources, uh, I would say Belarus's biggest capital is its people, highly educated people. And of course, if the situation turns for the worst, a lot of those highly educated people would go elsewhere. It's easy for them mm -hmm. to do. They would learn languages. Uh, all the neighboring countries uh, invited them to come in and set up and uh, will assist them. So it's going to be Lukashenko's loss and certainly Belarus's loss and no one wants that to happen. Many people are determined to stay back and do what they can. Plus people who had been forced to emigrate, they are ready to come back and chip in and help and build a new Belarus when the time is right, when they're not imprisoned for crossing right back. And um, in terms of workers' rights and rights to strike and rights to uh, decide the conditions in the enterprises, that's the whole new big issue. I've been in touch with the yeah, strike committees lately, and uh, one thing that needs to be really done is some de delegations, possibly for Western trade unions, coming in to their Belarusian partners and checking on the workers' uh, conditions, on the working conditions, on the ecology, on the ISO standards, because these are dire. And some, basically, when the, when the checking commission apparently comes to the factory, uh, everything is speak and span. Obviously, no one is beaten up and um, they're treated like royalty. And uh, when they leave, then workers cannot see the building for the smog. It's, you know, thick yellow smog or really bad pollution in some of the industrial towns. Uh, people have a very high rate of uh, cancer, um, uh, illnesses, uh, various other pollution-related illnesses. So it's, it's, it's not rosy at all. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very much a myth that Lukashenko has been such a good socialist um, manager, employer. It's, it's the opposite. The workers basically are paid not even the promised $500 equivalent. A lot are paid a lot less and have to do a lot more work for, for the money. It's not like, plus of course their contracts sometimes they extend it six months on, six months on, and if they put a foot wrong they're just chucked out. If they strike they're chucked out uh, and sometimes they could be charged and their uh, property will be confiscated, criminal case initiated, if uh, something goes wrong in the factory and it's down to a strike, allegedly. So they have to be very careful if, if they strike and shut down any production. Obviously, they want to do it safely. And uh, another thing that they would certainly be helped with if any Western companies would, uh, the partners, which currently working with the state enterprises, would actually, um, you know, put in some weight, some influence, uh, to have a say about the workers' conditions, corporate social responsibility, and all that. And not just send them letters saying, oh, look, you have to finish the contract no matter what. It should be, well, we, we, we fully support you. You have the right to voice your opinion, your right to strike, because we, we see what's happening at the moment. And it's not, uh, we want to support the, work, the workers. Um, and yes, back to the uh, taking to a high level. Today I've had one interview where uh, Pavel Latushka, um, he used to be um, a high level diplomat in the Lukashenko system, 
then he uh, sided with the people, he resigned and joined the coordination council. So now he, is, he was forced to um, uh, leave the country and he spoke from abroad. And he said, now it's very much Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's big call. It's a very, very big call because she is in a position that kind of life puts her in and she rose to the occasion. She has to decide whether she needs to call on the bond people to, you know, uh, take her exception as the president-elect and uh, then it has to be some inauguration of her, even though it might be not in Belarus but abroad. Or she has to, another plan, it has to be some way to hold the elections with help of everyone else. And then it will be another way for protesters, uh, another plan as well. We don't know what the plan is and how it will turn out. But at the moment, obviously, as any revolutions, it, lots of ups and downs, and lots of hope. Oh, I know that people that um, are taking time away from their families, from their jobs, from everything else they have, they want to build a fairer country. And it's going to be a properly fairer country with women's rights respected, with workers' rights respected, minorities' rights respected, and uh, basically taking the best. If they're taking something from the West, it will be the best, the best for you know, respecting human rights properly. And of course, the, the, the system of law, the supremacy of law. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Jimmy Kelly, with his hand raised. Uh, just while uh, we have Elena handy, um, there's three questions I would like to ask. And one of them is, a criticism that has often been labelled or levelled of the situation in Belarus is that the trade unions support Lukashenko. Now this often comes from people who have uh, loyalties or sympathies to the international communist parties. How valid is that statement and how accurate is that statement? The second one is uh, with the question of the winter coming on, I understand that from October on, Belarus can be a very barren place and very difficult to work in the open. Is it possible to sustain marches and demonstrations past October and into the hard winter? And the third one then is if weather is going to be a factor and it imposes a time limit on activity, is the issue of calling a general strike a practical one, a possible one, or a real one? Because from the, the, the opinion that I would have as an outsider is that the seizure of production by the workers is really the only way to bring this to a sudden and short end and push Lukashenko into the dustbin. So I'd leave with those three questions, Elena. Thank you. Can I bring David Henson in next? Um, yes, shall I uh, reply to those three as quickly as I can? Elena, can, you, can we let David come in and then bring you back to answer all of them? Of course. Okay, okay I, I apologize because there seems to be a bit of a zigzag in the discussion, but Elena, you know, fantastic uh, report. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to focus in on um, our two questions, really. Uh, that is, um, you know, the predicaments, the struggles of uh, shack dwellers in South Africa, and the question of uh, domestic violence. It's associated. And in a sense, I'm, I'm hoping to try and raise some issues, which I know that uh, Nomsa Sazani, you know, herself would want to raise. Could I mention that in the past few days, I've just learned that uh, Nomsa actually lost her son uh, with uh, police violence on a raid on a shack uh, community where you know she was in a place called Marion Hill. It's an old mission and just outside of Durban. And uh, you know, women who are standing up, you know, for their rights to housing at the moment are in, in, a, in a terrible uh, predicament. And, uh, you know, I have sent uh, messages to her of acknowledging, you know, what, what she's been through. 
but uh, you know the the struggles are, are quite uh, quite immense. Um, her son was not the first to have died uh, in uh, fighting for uh, housing rights in South Africa, and unfortunately, I have to say that the uh, ruling party, the African National Congress, which calls itself a liberation movement, is not above uh, assassinating uh, the leadership of the uh, Abashlali, uh, the organization of the homeless, those who are putting up shacks. Uh, now, these people are, are, are on the right in the center of um, you know, some communities, wherever there's an opportunity to get some land, as in Durban, it's in the case uh, it's situated right to, uh, against the uh, municipal dump. And I visited there often, and the stench is something to, you know, to, to have to breathe is, is, is an effort. Uh, the municipality sprays continuously into the air to try and dampen down the stench. But, uh, you know, imagine bringing up a child under, the, under those circumstances. And yet there's an extraordinary strength in Abishlali and these uh, communities. They're highly organized and they are active in uh, pressing their case uh, with the municipality and nationally and have the uh, perspective of seeing a mass civic movement, a mass movement of poor and working people in South Africa uh, to be able to claim their rights and to be able to have a, have a life. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that I think what I'd like to do in the future is to do an interview uh, with uh, Nomsa Sazani, she's a, a marvelous speaker. If you consider she's not sure from day to day how she's living or where she's staying, uh, and and yet she's you know been able to act as a as a, as a spokesperson, you know, for for such a magnificent movement, a movement that lasted more than ten years. It's going nowhere. It's knocking on the door all the time and demanding uh, rights, the rights which were promised. Uh, when the ANC came to power and have been denied every day since. So, you know, the message that uh, we'd like to pass on uh, to Abashlali and to those who are struggling in South Africa, particularly the informal sector women who are on the streets that Pat has mentioned and those who are struggling to maintain their homes, is that there's international solidarity in reporting their demands, their concerns on the agenda. Uh, thank you. Mm. Thank you, David. And I'm sorry, I am aware that we're jumping around in, in terms of topics, but I'll take uh, Dave um, Buxton next, and then I'll bring Elena back. Dave? Okay, I want to address the first issue that was under discussion, which is women at work and trade unions. And I'm coming to the view that um, we have to carefully uh, analyse the role of the let's call it the traditional trade union federations um, and whether they're fit for purpose. And I would argue that they're in many ways they're not. And that's why membership is, continues to dwindle away. And, um, you know, they, they can be very bureaucratic. Any activists, uh, many activists within some unions in Great Britain uh, become victims of the union themselves, as I was. And it, and it sort of uh, creates a lot of demoralization with the activists, um, not only the, the one that's been victimized, but those around who see that the union attacks the best organizers, if you like. So I think we have to look outside of the traditional forms. I'm not dismissing them. I think that they're, they're, um, they have to be uh, democratized. But for example, I've only found out in the last few months about the independent workers of Great Britain who are trying to organize delivery couriers, for example, uh, city sprint couriers, and uh, also trying to work around the issue of congestion charge and minicab workers in London, which of course there are tens of thousands of these in London. So they're trying to organize people who you could say are precarious, uh, for good examples. And the other union is called United Voices of the World, and on their, if you look on their website, they've had uh, declare these victories at St. Mary's Hospital, University of Greenwich, London School of Economics, the Daily Mail, Sotheby's, Chanel, Topshop, and it goes on and on. And at the forefront, particularly of the United Voices of the World, is putting strike action at the, right at the forefront. And I think um, 
I've also read about, no, I watched a video of this uh, union organizer in America, Jane McElvey, <laughs> who in around 2003 in, uh, in one of the states in America where the, the uh, level of union organization was really, really low, they managed to organize um, union membership in four hospitals and that was through using the power of strike action. Now, the point I want to make about strike action being at the fore, <coughs> I read also that, um, that unions um, in, let's say, in the latter decades have turned to this idea of social dialogue as the means of, of making, uh, protecting workers and, and, and getting some change. And they got to that position uh, not because you know, they're ace negotiators and that's really the, the right way to, for unions to go, but because they, they got that on the back of massive strike waves in previous generations. So the employers were looking at ways to try and nullify the effectiveness of trade unions. And the way they did that is in a way is to say, oh, we're, co we're, gonna, we're prepared to negotiate. But as we've gone on and the, and the number of union, people in unions have declined, so the power of, uh, of social dialogue and negotiation has dwindled. So I think we need to, to analyze what's going wrong with the unions, have a, a really um, strong argument about the existing ways of organizing. And I think some of the unions in, in Britain, for example, I know the Baker's Union have, um, were trying to organize in, in small baker, well, large chains, but in small bakers and, and other small, um, uh, outfits where there's uh, a large preponderance of women workers and the other last part I'll mention is that I think we also tie that to community struggles because where we're losing let's call it the social wage which is um, services that uh, that the unions have often campaigned for where we're losing that and people are struggling against a loss of services, we should be saying, not only do we fight within the workplace, but we should be organizing the community as well. And a good example of that is the privatization of schools and academies. So in the area where I am, there was a really powerful campaign which stopped acad uh, schools from academizing. And they, they were parents really big picket lines of parents and strikers within the school. So I think that's a, it's a brilliant example to show the way forward, but I think we need to be more open-minded about how unions work. If they're not um, doing the job they should be doing, then look into other unions that could be more effective in, in uh, winning rights uh, uh, for workers, particularly precarious and women workers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, can we um can we can we now go back to um sorry i've had a message saying can we invite myra to speak about uprising in ecuador yes of course we can but can i can i ask elena just to answer the question she was asked and then we can move on to um to myra yes elena sorry I'm, i really do apologize that this is bitty but it's the name it's the name of the game i think of where we are at the moment Thank you, Felicity. Yes, I'll be as flexible as I can be. <laughs> and um, yeah, <laughs> try to do my bit for the team as well. Um, yeah, so first uh, question from Jimmy was um, um, whether trade unions really do support Lukashenko. Well, we did have some independent trade union reps at one of our meetings uh, a few weeks uh, ago. And I'm still in touch with them and all the strike committees. Uh, well, there is one, hello, there was uh, one, just one uh, official union, pro-Lukashenko union, which is the official one. And that's the only one which supports him because uh, they've got no other way. They, they, they haven't got any other purpose but to support and do, do as they're told. Uh, however, if you look at their websites, they've got maybe about 20 likes of what they post and have a look at the independent trade union website. You can see how much is of the actual real life workers communication in Belarus, how much they interact with their colleagues from outside Belarus, similar trade unions, 
they are members of global unions and um, they basically want to adopt the best practices. They want to help people to leave the official trade union, which is a bit like you don't really have a choice. You join and there you stay uh, if you want to have your, your job effectively. It's not really their choice and um, they're trying to make it easy for people to leave and take a risk and join the independent trade union where that would be they would be writing the script for the actual workers union and uh, yeah those guys they certainly will be able to happy to to comment or to write reply to this properly so yes that's that's a myth because that's an official trade union um, and and they purposely that official trade union another thing i was told that they purposely were squeezing out all the most active activist workers from their jobs, from their work. Um, really, all they need is some very obedient. Uh, so the second question, uh, was the bad weather coming in? Well, today it wasn't the best weather in Belarus. It was driving rain, it was very strong winds, and people walked um, about 10 miles in, in that weather, uh, you know, going around the police, going around the tear gas, um, water cannons, uh, to add to the natural rain. Um, they still, they still did come out, um, and they've got their big winter coats ready. And uh, another thing I wanted to mention that the protest is taken, um, like, is distributed form now, because after the marches and between the marches, everyone goes to their sleeping districts. Everyone goes to where they live. All the like um, high-rise dwellers, they all get together. They have events right there outside. They have free lectures about the history, the culture of Belarus, uh, about what's going on. Uh, they, uh, you know, they drink tea, they bond, they get some solidarity, they help each other, find out who needs help. They, they're really like one for all and all for one. They do amazing street art, um, you know, amazing creative graffiti. Uh, they do what they can. And, um, Basically, because Belarus has this history of being a partisan movement country, Second World War, this is what people are very good at. Even though they might be, you know, having a very poker face, turning up for their job, and um, yeah, they'll be doing what they can to actually make, make a change. And uh, because they know there are 97% of them in the country thinking alike, and it's only 3% that really needs to, you know, get to move on and leave, uh, or change sides, some of them. Uh, and plus a lot of police, of the actual police, are resigning because they are just not prepared to beat people. And of course they're getting a lot of, um, well, being ostracized by their families, their friends. Um, people write on their doors sometimes saying so-and-so that have beaten and raped so many lives here. And of course mm -hmm. it's not nice coming home reading that. So you'd like you you'll be looking behind your shoulder all the time, but so far people are not stooping as low as to reciprocate with violence. Although of course there are hotheads saying, "Oh come on, this is much quicker than peaceful protest." Um, so there are lots of voices with various opinions. As as for the time limit um, on activity, well, protest might change. It might coalesce. It might consolidate. Uh, new leaders will emerge. And they are emerging, people taking charge. And um, yes, those, lead, those who are now outside the country would have to obviously rise to the challenge. You know, they have to, they are currently at the crossroads, what to do, which way to go, either to do government in exile or to call on the free and fair election. And in fact, the EU and the US were hoping to do a joint uh, sanctions package together. So it still might be happening. And. Uh, position of Cyprus is not necessarily a hindrance. Yeah. And I just wanted to say one thing about the, um, uh, the diaspora solidarity. Solidarity is happening inside the country and lots of ways of resisting and uh, moving the situation on are being invented, like as we speak. Um, in the, uh, the worldwide solidarity, there were a couple of big solidarity days with Belarus when uh, people, Belarusians and friends of Belarus all around the world had uh, actions, events, demonstrations. Uh, today, uh, I'm just trying to, to get the, the exact text. Today was the Belarus says no action, which I successfully missed because I was 
on, on this call and another call. But um, um, in London, for example, there was a, a picket uh, opposite the Belarusian embassy. Um, uh, Saint Doris says no to violence. Uh, no to so just I'm just trying to find the exact uh, exact uh, text there. And uh, no to Lukashenko. No to violence. No to dictatorship. And Saturday night um, uh, there were similar events in the states, in Europe, uh, in the East, in Australia, Oceania. Uh, there were uh, in uh, today in the morning, and there are various like Facebook groups by the country they're all getting joined up globally uh, we're finally not just chatting between ourselves in our kitchens but uh, joining up finding out who else is doing what and uh, it's it's becoming really global and um, i think it's um i wouldn't i wouldn't put a time limit on it some people said it's gonna sort out itself by november but Lukashenko, very uh, you know, without telling one, decided to self-inaugurate um, a couple of months before, mm -hmm. uh, and of course he did it in secret, even from his own supporters. No one knew, and at the last minute when the ceremony already started, they were still saying, "No, we don't know. We have no information." And then just put uh, one picture in a short statement of him. So that was a complete farce. And uh, in November would have been his last, uh, like when he would have been no longer legitimate president but now now he kind of sped that up that he's no longer legitimate president or anyone to do something and uh, it's a question of uh, what's next and other people were saying that obviously with the general strike it will be all over by christmas if not before in terms of general strike it's something that is being worked at and uh, more and more enterprises are joining and it's not easy for them at all because of the thing that the authorities are scared of the most they know that it's going to just completely wipe down the economy. It's not going to be good for anyone else, but once they're gone, it will all spring back up. It will be restored. And uh, once workers uh, feel in control. So it's uh, what, what's happening at the moment. Um, they arrested, uh, at least as of today, five activists of the strike channel called BASTA. And uh, they're trying to opened a criminal case against them and uh, it's very scary to even think what, the, what the, those people are going to face. We're just trying to get more information and uh, drum up some support and of course watch what's happening but it's it's difficult. Um, it's, it's different because they were arrested one by one before and did some time one by one but now they were all arrested in a like a real swoop through windows and doors. The red police came in, they were grabbed and all put together and now they are trying to present it as a criminal organization trying to disrupt the uh, production trying to disrupt the country so certainly uh, it's a real hunt for activists of strikers any hunt for anyone who is supporting or encouraging the strikes um, and people are very aware they're very careful and um, well uh, they're still carrying on with all that happening Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I have, um, sorry, I'm trying to take a note. There was a comment from Janet Owen, um, driver, is it the surname, about what's going on in, in the States. Would you like to speak for a minute on that, Janet? Um, hi. Sure. There's, a, I'm a, a teacher in a community college and, um, you know, there's a lot more listening at the moment to for the possibility of strike action than I've ever heard previously. I've lived in the States for the last 25 years and worked in education for the majority of that time. Um, many of you probably know about the very precarious situations of non-tenured faculty um, in American colleges where you're working uh, on contracts for three month contracts, there's no benefits, there's no um, right to reemployment. If your classes don't fill, you might make do all the work to teach the class, but then have it cut in the first week of the semester. So it's a very, very precarious um, occupation. So there's been a lot of work in the last two or three years around 
unionizing particularly adjunct faculty um, who are carrying enormous bills for their education most of them have got PhDs some of them are living in cars etc so this is a, a population ripe for unionization but of course the colleges and universities and the Department of Education are fighting back and one of their primary weapons is um, the history of anti-trade unionism rhetoric and propaganda which is still incredibly heavy here in the states but i think that one of the things that helped to counter that is the run of k-12 that's kindergarten through 12th grade schools the run of um, strikes that were happening last year and the year before that were successful and one of the the one that I was involved in was the LA teachers strike, um, which was successful and it was incredibly well supported by members of the public. You know, you'd have the out on the picket line outside the school in the driving rain, unusually for Los Angeles. It was really kind of miserable time of year, but you'd have parents bringing their kids to the picket line, bringing you know, baked goods and coffee, and there was massive support from the public um, for teachers. So that that was an indication to me that there is uh, more willingness than I have seen before in the United States, at least in my little part of it, for uh, union activity and strike activity. And my teachers' union is is slowly advancing towards um strike action that will probably take place unless uh you know the concession the the changes we're asking for are made sometime next year thank you very much janet that was very useful and um as a retired teacher with many many years in the union you know good luck to that and incidentally the Zero hours contracts are most common in Britain in catering, but the second place they're most common in is in higher education. And um, so we've got a similar situation from developing that you've you've described as well. Could if, we now bring? Sorry, I, I just wanted to add that there is a difference, though, that you know was brought home forcibly to me when I moved from the UK to the US. Here there's no, and I'm sure you all know, know this, there is no cushion. So an adjunct faculty who has zero, you know, a, a basically equivalent of a zero hours contract has no access to healthcare because healthcare uh, is provided here through your employer. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's really bad for the, uh, you know, these highly, highly educated, highly qualified people. Not that that makes them superior or different from any other worker. It's just that, you know, they don't, they, they're carrying the burden of that educational debt also that could be a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah, it's worth reminding us of that because indeed, you know, the NHS the NH is yeah, so precious. Yeah. The NHS is very precious and very, very fragile at the moment. Could I ask our comrade to tell us a little bit about the situation in Ecuador? Yes, sure. I could. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. It has been a, such a pleasure to to hear. I cannot remember the the person from South Africa, uh, Elena, uh, just they just listening the struggles that we suffer in every single country. We have so much similarities in Ecuador. Basically, you know, being a, such a fragile country where Unfortunately, uh, possibly for me, it's very hard to say about this, but um, as many of you might be aware, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, are organizations of the United States um, who actually uh, implement economic policies in our poor countries, therefore living in, in a massive poverty and, desper and desperation giving money to to corrupt government because uh, you know the more you read the evidence and you reach to these conclusions in ecuador we actually have a corrupt government 
who still who are still who was still in the resources are still still in the resources, and yet the International Monetary Fund has given them the money. This government has the cheek to reduce to the richest people of the country of 4.6 million, a million on interest, just on interest, and he get from the International Monetary Fund 4.2 million. Obviously, to summarize, he, ha, he got more money than that, but just for you to put into context what is actually, what is actually is happening, you know? And we have a big monster behind us. And it's these people who are actually leading to the, all the suffering, not just women, you know, the poorest people, children, the youngsters, where they are obliged to follow these economic yes. policies, where the government, they have to privatize all the resources, included education, included health, all the minerals, all the oils, but first of all, what they did in Ecuador, and to me, time and time again, they do exactly the same in every single country. If you, if you read uh, the literature, what is happening in Africa, what is happening recently in Greece, first of all, the governments, what they do, and um, together with the elite of every single country, they pretend and they lie through the, uh, med through the, through the media, telling people that the resources that the country has they, they are good for nothing. They are in, inefficient and they only provide expenditure for the government, which is absolutely rubbish and absolutely liar. All of this is leaving millions of people, because I cannot say even thousands, we could say billions of people worldwide and so much suffering. In Ecuador at the moment, we have a corrupt, a corrupt government, a thief government because it's stealing everything they have they have among the people in the government they have shared all the resources in ecuador together with the together with the international organizations giving the names for the international monetary fund and for unfortunately we are in a struggle since the last october we've been in the streets last october we have several people who were killed by this government thousands of people were imprisoned Hundreds of people will 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 in, 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 sorry were damaged in somehow eyes were removed legs were removed it was absolutely atrocious and people again are organizing again because this government has totally dismantled the country and we are still str struggling. Uh, I normally I am quite active with my comrades in New Ham, but at the moment I'm actually. I've been very often trying to defend the right in Ecuador, trying to meet with different people and organ, organize people, writing letters to our MPs, writing here to the United Nations to defend our nation. You know, I don't know when we're going to stop the International Monetary Fund, but it's the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank that is the big issue and is the big problem. Are the are the um, are the guilty ones or leaving millions of people in extreme in extreme poverty together with the elites of every single country. Thank you so much for listening to me, but I think our struggles are similar with all of us. Felicit, your microphone is off. Apologies, I'm ranting on and no one can hear me. I'm very sorry. Um, thank you very much, Myra. Please do keep in touch and make sure that, you know, we are told when you need things raising, when there are campaign points around Ecuador that we can help with. I think that is really, really important. And um, in Britain, we're seeing public services completely wrecked and well not completely wrecked but severely damaged and we do recognize that the people who saw this happen first were countries in the global south where the imf and the world bank insisted on restructuring maybe 10 years before they did it to the west um, but the damage in britain is 
you know, we're well aware that we have to take the lessons from what happened to you and how we, how we fight back. Um, is there anyone else who's at this moment wants to come into this part of the discussion? I can't see any raised hands on my participant list. Leslie, did you want to come in? Yes, please, Leslie. Yeah, just um, well, thank you for the contributions and solidarity to you all. Um, just a couple of points. First of all, here the nurses um, have set up their own organisation um, from the sort of nurses say no campaign to the uh, refusal of the pay rise. Um, they now have an organisation called Nurse United which is a, a rank and file organisation that's being paid for out of their own donations. And, um, you know, it's, it's very small, but it's got a wide reach. And they've been self-organising. And now they've got um, the GNM and Unite in words at any rate to support the 15% pay rise. RCN are saying something like 12%. Unison are saying 2,500 flat rate. Under the circumstances, flat rate pay rise is not a bad thing because it raises everybody. But obviously, when you've had a pay cut for 10 years, Two and a half thousand doesn't amount to very much. Um, one of the things that they've been doing is they have a batch Wednesday where they all wear the 15% pay rise batch on a Wednesday and go into work and try and have a discussion with their colleagues or in the um, cafe or the canteen or wherever going in the hospital to talk to people and they've been going around leaving in their own hospitals putting up um, posters so you know that's that's an example of mainly women and it's mainly student nurses and younger women not exclusively um, trying to self-organise and as I said last week knock on the door of the trade unions or kick the door in some cases um, Secondly, the, uh, the UCU, the Imagine College of Lecturers, has been strikes earlier uh, this year and the end of last year um, over pension, but also pay in conditions. And many, many people are on short term contracts, and many women don't get promotion many women are on short-term contracts not exclusively but there were a lot of women on the um, on the picket lines and obviously the universities are coming using covid as an excuse to to, um, you know, to, to come back for um for more so i think we'll see more develop there the MU is interesting because they've had um Although that's been an amalgamation of traditional teach. Sorry. Yeah. We can't hear you very well. Yeah. Leslie, we can't hear you very well. Yeah, sorry. Leslie, Leslie, could you could you call me and link to the call through your phone? Because we're not hearing you. No, she's not on the video unless she's not got the video. Yeah. Yeah. We can hear about one word in three, Leslie. Could you call me and I'll link you to the phone link you to the meeting by the phone? Uh, okay. Is that any better? No. Yeah. Oh, okay, I think it might be my internet connection. I think it's your uh, connection, yeah. Could you, could you call me? 
Right, could you stop talking now, Leslie? Yeah, okay. And can anybody else who's got the microphone that not muted please mute themselves so we can actually get some order back in? Um, I'm going to I'll summarise what Leslie said. Okay, I'll, I'll um I'll be now listening. Thank you. Yes, I will do. Yeah. Okay. So if you switch off, Leslie, I'll put, I will put your you on the phone through to um to this. Okay. Right. Okay, carry on, Leslie, using the phone. I'm not talking. <laughs> Can't do it. Can't manage this. Stop for a minute. Sorry. Right, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for the technical problems there. What Leslie was talking about is there's been a big move in the employment in, in, in amongst the hospital workers to actually go push rank and file trade unionism demanding this um the demanding a, a realistic pay increase um and they have really taken it into the hospitals themselves with getting people to wear badges demanding the pay rise and organizing in you know, organizing amongst the rank and file of the trade unions and it's been you know very young nurses in the in the forefront of this either people who are student nurses or those who are very recently qualified and um, obviously being nurses, predominantly women in, in that struggle. And Leslie also mentioned the issue of the, um, of the UCU um, strikes that have taken place and the level of organisation and how many people have joined the unions, the teaching unions and the education unions um, during the um during the lockdown period and the and the struggles around around the virus can people hear me properly yeah okay that that's fine um there was a message from someone saying go to a different room but i, I wish i could do but if it wasn't aimed at me that's fine um right can i is there anybody else who wants to come in at this point i want to move on certainly by by a quarter to nine to what we do next the next steps is there anyone who would like to come in um at this point david your hand is up is it intentionally still up dave henson um look i've i've spoken i'd like to come in towards the end to see how we continue but let me not say anything more now mm. okay thank you um, right, I want to move then to the um, concluding section of the meeting. I do apologise, the comrades from the um, domestic violence issues have sent apologies. There are urgent matters that they've, they've had to deal with. Um, and we will have to come back to that section at, a, at another, me another meeting. We have had a, an interim meeting since the last, last week's meeting where we discussed what we were going to do next on that issue and um, we can share that with you at you know either at, at another point I think um, and obviously the issue of housing which is crucial has not yet been been discussed but I think the whole housing issue is something that we could we, we could devote a whole meeting to especially with the issue in Britain of evictions and the situation in the states with um with the mass unemployment leading possibly to yet another round of evictions there and what we have been described from the shack dwellers and the issues around housing in many other countries um so can i now move on and i want to talk i want to ask people to talk about how do we pull this together you know I think using different this using Zoom format, but other formats as well to develop the links technically, and what the purposes of the links would be. Um, so, can I ask for contributions on that point, including from David if he wants to come in at this point, but from the women comrades especially.
in which case I'm going to come up with the proposals that we've discussed and think we, we might maybe could do. One is to set up um, perhaps a discussion, either an email group or a WhatsApp group amongst the women involved in, this, um, in these seminars to see how we can link um, our work. I think that the work, the point about solidarity is to give strength individually and collectively to the people involved in struggle. And that's uh, itself a very important point but also international solidarity on a very simple level and on as sophisticated a level as we can, directly affects the people who are oppressing us. They affect the governments, they affect the trade unions who might not be listening to us or might be directly involved in our, in our oppression. Um, so using, you know, using solidarity is massively important. I'm suggesting that we set up a, a website, a very simple website, and um, simply to carry reports of women's struggles in different parts of the world um, so that we can have videos from, um, from the different parts, from Zira, from the shack dwellers, from what's going on in Zimbabwe, from Belarus, from all the different struggles that we are aware of so that we can see if, if that works. It might work, it might not work, but can I see if comrades think that they are useful ways forward? Pam, what do you think? I'm throwing it at people now. Pam? Sorry, you've caught me on the hop then. <laughs> <laughs> Ways in which we can pull things together. Um, I think I think we need an easy way of communication. I'm not a great fan of WhatsApp myself because it tends to come at you all the time. I'm wondering if there's some other method we could use. Yeah. Well, um, anyone else? Okay. Maybe well, I. Uh, sorry, uh, on, I, if I could, uh, excuse me, cutting in. I mean, I really, you know, I'd love to hear what Maddie might might think. <laughs> but anyway, let me offer, you know, some some ideas. Uh, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of some exchange with uh, Elena, who's got the most marvelous uh, network of links uh, into Belarus. And at times there are five women who prepared to speak and, and who are available to speak. Um, excuse our visitor in the background, you might hear a dog. <laughs> uh, and uh, at other times, maybe 10 or even 15. Now, each of them would like to at least have their 10 minutes, but uh, and maybe more. Um, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's a challenge. So what I do think is what, you know, we could do, and, and of course, there's a language issue, because we really, you know, we are kind of, uh, you know, English speaking. Um, but I do think if we could lay up a store of, um, of interviews with people, I would love to hear more from Nomsa and uh, other people who are right there in the front line in Ecuador. Uh, Myra's done some marvelous uh, interventions, um, more from, you know, Zero, so that we hear her clearly to know exactly what's going on. I see that she's on Facebook you know, live streaming, you know, qu quite often each week. So we, uh, Tia, who is not present this time, uh, you know, I'm sorry to, to say, but look, we, you know, maybe an interview with her. Uh, in other words, to gather together, you know, material which could be on a simple website or a Facebook page, certainly a Facebook page, you know, people do seem to be familiar with that. Um, in other words, let's bring together, um, you know, clear, well-spoken, uh, very interesting, but not too long uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. And then I know we'll be listening to them and, and uh, you know, we want to take it further. Um, let me just leave it at that and say that, you know, let's uh, also schedule a talk, um, another convening of a discussion, maybe in a month's time uh, to see where, where we are. In between, you know, there's the work in Bel Belarus there's the work that uh, we'd like to see in, in relation to 
you know, the women who are imprisoned, I mean, detained in Zimbabwe. Anyway, there's, there's so many things which are, are coming up, but we want to continue our strong streams like the work, a marvelous work, which I'd like to thank the comrades for in relation to Belarus. It's having some effect. And then let's see how we can bring it all together and then discuss again, maybe in a month's time. Mm. You're Michael from Felicita. Felicity, okay. <laughs> turn you mic on. Felicity, <laughs> turn your mic on. Yeah. Turn you your mic it off on. and turn it on, yeah. <laughs> right, sorry, comrades. So, is there any other. Um, contributions from anybody on these issues are we are we thinking we should meet to discuss this more often because obviously we have lots of different subjects at the sunday night meeting do you think we need a separate group to follow this theme along anybody i mean the traditional thing is a women's group which i'm not particularly mad on but that's a possibility i suppose i i think it's essential yeah if we're going to get anywhere i think we we really do need to have you know one that's devoted to the issues around around women. You know, we're aware that women are a majority of trade unionists in the UK, but it doesn't mean that there aren't separate issues that women need yeah. to, to discuss. Well, that's what we should do then, yeah. David? Yeah, I, I just want to comment on uh, the ideas. I, I agree with Pat, Pam that WhatsApp, uh, I, I just find it very annoying, the, the amount of messages they, you tend to get a lot of small little bitty bits of comment and then people don't seem to make appropriate remarks on these groups and the Facebook page you you can have the membership private and but it, it a lot many many people use that you can put lengthier articles on there or you can put links to it or, or you can have videos of actions that are ongoing and you can then forward that via Facebook to many other Facebook users. So I think um, I think Facebook have sort of restricted sharing to large numbers of people. I think there's probably ways around it. And I agree that the I was shocked by last week's meeting where um, I think it was Amy said four women were killed in one week in that area. I was you know I was absolutely shocked and we need to be doing something. We need to at least publicize that this is going on, these sorts of things. And then it's, it's even worse in other countries as we've heard from Pakistan, for example. And, and we need, to, I agree, we have to have a specific presence about women in struggle uh, and, then, and, and then promote that. Um, so I, I agree with the general ideas that we need to find other forms of publicizing these issues. Thank you. Okay. Okay, comrades. So I'm going. Can I have then sort of permission from the from the group here? Wynne has a small amount of money in a bank account that I I have, um, that we can pay eighty pound to set up um, a website on women's struggles. We'll dream up a. I'll talk to Jabu about getting a good name for it, um, and we'll get a good. We'll get a, a you know a a WordPress thing set up this week, if that's acceptable to people. Can can we have a general yay, yes or yeah. no to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank yeah. you. So yeah. that will be that will be point one. David, can you make sure you try and get us um, an interview um, from your comrades in South Africa um, and and in Zimbabwe? So we've got definite interview things, and I will take responsibility for trying to get one with Zira. Um, can our comrades um, from Ecuador try and make sure that we get something? And Elena, I'm certain you will produce us some excellent work um, from Belarus to really you know, make sure. And, and then it's pointless having those things on the website unless you individually take responsibility to share it as widely as you possibly can so that we get and strategically, not just a sort of broadcast one, but sharing it where it might actually 
you know, strike a, a chord with people and help their struggle as well. Um, and we'll make sure that we've got, we'll get an interview with the Nurses United as well um, for it. So we've got very definite things to do. Um, can I ask whether people would prefer it to be um, a WhatsApp or a, um, a discussion, a, you know, an email discussion list? Um, if you think WhatsApp, can you stick your hand up and I can see? If you think this, an email list is better, can you put your hand up for that? Okay, generally it seems to be an email list. Thank you very much. So we've got a lot to do. Um, David, I'm going to be reliant on you for um, emails to get the email list set up. Um, and if you haven't sent an email to, to David, please send one. So he's got that. Pam? Just to say, Felicity, if you want me to help you with some stuff, I, I'd be happy to work along with you to get this created, yeah. So yes, please. Really, uh, I think it's brilliant. So we've got to set a meeting up as well, aren't we now? So. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I think that will be really, really good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and Trish, I'm going to call on you as well for some help. We need, we need all the help we can get. Right. Thank you. Right, comrades. We're coming towards the end of the meeting. Roger, did you want to say anything in this last couple of minutes? Just, uh, we are working on uh, <clears throat> on a meeting next week. Uh, uh, just please, just watch your inboxes and you'll get uh, information. I just want to say also how exhilarated I am by how well this work is going. Well, thank you very much to everyone. Is there anyone here who wants to say something that anyone else needs to know? Any, any struggle you want to share in the last couple of minutes that we've got? No. Sorry, come on. I don't know, but please speak. You're, you're Mac Mac on this. <laughs> I think that's ready. Yeah. You can hear me. Um, I've been following this debate very closely, very, very interesting discussions. And I've got, thanks to Elena, a much better idea of what's happening in Belarus. But there's one thing that someone suggested this evening that I do object to, and that is that we have a women's only meet section. Uh, if it's a section, okay, but if it's an organization as such, then I'm very much against it. I was very much involved in the women's movement in the 1970s in South Africa, in London, and to some extent later on in Sweden. And my experience is that we have limited powers to get across in a women's only organization. In this particular setup this evening, we have fabulous men who have similar ideas and therefore I think it's unnecessary in this context, particularly, to have a women's only organization. Thank you for listening to my views. We're not about to, to lock anybody out. The people who want to help can help, but I think we're talking about something that very much focuses on the issues of women. And that can't be done without, without that focus. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that. But there are a lot of men who do support the progress and the struggle of women. Sadly many that don't but the um we um right thank you very much oh pam you wanted to say something come on yes yeah, so <laughs> no i'm not saying goodbye i just wanted to say i mean no no discredit to the men who are all fantastic but i have noticed there's a tendency to be a lot more than men than women involved in this sort of thing 
So, I mean, I'm not a great fan of um, women's organisations anyway, like Mac Mac. Mac well, sorry, I know you're not called Mac Mac, I can't what your name is. But I, th- I think actually it could be quite useful, really, because we definitely are a bit thin on the ground at times, I think. Uh, I don't know where everybody else thinks that. Yeah. Well, the, we have had, you know, in Spain the year before last, we had a women's strike that went into millions of people. And the men looked after, did the jobs that women do at home unpaid on the day of that strike. There was a role for the men in, in, the, in, in that position. But we can, unless the women themselves are organised, we, you know, the classic is the rising of the women is the rising of the class. And if you go right back to the foundation of trade unions, the unskilled trade unions in this country, the people who started that were the women in the match in the match factories, and the person who still, um, the GMB still have a commemorative um, sort of competition um, each year for Eleanor Marks, who founded the GMB. So let's you know, unless we organise the women, the class will not rise. Um, and you know, we haven't really gone into why we're here in the in that sense, but. We are for the fundamental transformation of society, for the ending of capitalism and for the ending of patriarchy. And doing that requires the mass mobilization of women. Now we're not gonna do a, we're not gonna mobilize en masse by having a simple website and a simple discussion group, but we'll certainly help along the way in doing that and make sure that our efforts aren't dissipated and that we do pull more people in together. So Thank you very much, comrades. I think I'm going to leave it at that point. Um, it's been a very interesting meeting. And thank you to Elena, especially to our comrades from Ecuador, from the comrades and from Jabu, and to all the people who've made it such a good contribution to this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.